Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitemout.com and P.O. Combs Asian Art in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And today is Monday, September 21st, 2020. And in this video, we're going to take a look at the preview of the uh, important Chinese ceramics and works of art sale. Uh, here's the catalog that will be conducted during Asia Week in New York in just a few days on September 25th. Uh, it is a terrific auction. It has some extremely interesting lots in it and, uh, and, and great provenance. A lot of the things have provenance are actually almost mind-blowing, including uh, the Shah Jahan from India, who was the uh, head of the Mughal court that uh, during the 15th century, who, or 16th century rather, who, who built the, the Taj Mahal. There's a plate in here that was in his collection, and we're going to talk about that. And we're going to take a look at a few more things that have been gifted over from the, uh, the uh, Florence and uh, Herbert Irving collection. We all remember them. They lived in New York. Uh, he, they were prolific uh, uh, and active collectors of Asian art for many, many years. They were also <clears throat> huge philanthropists uh, for cancer and medical research. Uh, they were unbelievably generous. They left most of their collection, or a big chunk of it anyway, to the Metropolitan Museum. And the museum deaccessioned a few things that were repeats as was allowed. He said, you know, get keep what you like, get rid of it, raise some money for the museum. And uh, there have been several auctions of, of, of some of the things from his sale, from his collection uh, that are just amazing. And uh, uh, the sale, did, uh, of course, did phenomenally well. He was a longtime collector with he and his wife. His wife was very, very active, in his, and they shared this interest for a long time. We're going to take a look at a few of those things and uh, some other stuff. There's all kinds of things going on. And uh, one of the things that is in the sale, we'll start sort of at the beginning, is this really great Northern Qi Dynasty. Uh, this is a big, big uh, limestone carving. Uh, beautifully done. Blow it up here. It measures about 67 inches tall, it, uh, so it's just a little under six feet, and uh, is done very much in the in the uh, in influence. The Qi carvings were very influenced by the by the uh, by the Indian Gupta style carving of Buddhist figures. Uh, very simple, straight lobes, no piercings, um, the small mouths, uh, beautifully done, and very simple robes. Sort of the way the robes are done, they're just sort of drawn on, just implying that they're on there. Not a lot of heavy folds and and uh, extra embellishment, but this is a beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful example, and I, ex I expect it'll do pretty well. It hasn't been on the market in, in a number of years. It's estimated at four hundred to six hundred thousand dollars U.S. And uh, let's see here, it had been in the Sackler collection, and before that, it had come from the J. Ty J. T. Ty collection all well known and it was uh, bought from the Sackler collection last on the market in 1974 and this is the kind of thing that gets people very very excited because it's been a long time off the market almost 50 years um, and uh, came had, had impeccable provenance going back some uh, the, 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 it's just a great looking thing and if you take the time I urge you to take the time I love the hair on it the way they did the, these little pinwheel uh, devices in the hair which was very very typical of Qi Dynasty uh, uh, stone carvings and this very elongated simple ear and these beautiful serpentine eyes just a great thing it has a wonderful surface um, you can and they and they as, as the all the auction houses have lately they've done a great job of providing uh, much better images than they used to that can really enlarge and, and give you a chance to examine things up close get a real good sense of the surface by the way when you're looking at surfaces and photographs always look for areas like this where the where I'm pointing where there's a reflection because it gives you a very good sense of the texture and the same is, is true on on porcelains jades any any sort of firm surface you always look at those glaze those lit areas where the light reflects, just as a little hint, and um, you can pick up a, a very good sense of the surface. All right, four to six hundred thousand. We'll see how that goes, and then on to this. This is something from, uh, I believe, from the Irving collection. Yeah, this I'm kind of surprised. I'm not sure why this is being sold. Maybe it wasn't offered. It originally was uh, by repute had been sold by C.T. Liu, the famous uh, Chinese dealer, and then it was sold quote the property of a gentleman in 1983, and then Spink and Sons had it and, and sold it. In 1983 to the Irvings. And uh, this is a, an absolutely exceptional uh, carved uh, jade uh, Qinlong period elephant. And uh, it's very auspicious. This is a very auspicious thing. Uh, this is the boys uh, washing the elephant, riding the elephant, carrying vases. And these are all uh, symbols for prosperity and um, uh, peaceful times ahead and all, all of that sort of uh, stuff. And it's just, uh, but the carving is just stupendously fine. 
It's just stupendously fine. There's a very similar one in the Palace Museum collection. And uh, if you take the time to come in and really look at it, as I said, look at the reflections and uh, the fine, fine, fine detail about the ears, the trunk, the way the, the, way the, 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 the skin is rippled and folded on the body. And then the little things like the, like the peach, the peaches being carried by the boy. And uh, here they are riding and here these uh, other boys climbing up and cleaning the elephant and then carrying the vase. Just, uh, just a spectacular package all the way around. And it's pretty good size. It was seven inches tall, estimated at five to $800,000. And I would not be at all surprised to see this go over the estimate. Uh, absolutely splendid. And, the, and you'll notice if you look at the jade, you'll find that it's absolutely flawless jade. Absolutely flawless jade in the in the in the in a perfect color, and that's what collectors want. And then now throw in the provenance, and it's got a wonderful Hongmu stand with it on top of it. Just a great object. And then over to here, this is part of the uh, what was it? I'm going to get the name right here. The Brown collection. Lenore and Walter Brown. He was a Texas oil guy that got into collecting back in the in the 50s and 60s. I guess he he was very active in his community. He was a big fan of uh, Asian art. He, be, he became a real auction hound, according to the write up on him. I'd heard his name, but I didn't know much about him. I'd heard he was involved with a museum in Texas um, and uh, donating objects. And this is just some of the stuff he owned. He loved Ming Dynasty ceramics really did and he loved and a lot of his pieces were uh, very focused on on the types that you'll find of uh, young Lu Jundi period that you'll find in um, in India and in uh, the, like the top copy museum and so forth and one of them uh, is this absolutely splendid um, uh, uh, Ming Dynasty Young Lo dish, and it's a, a rather unusual dish in that the uh, the rim, the outer rim, you notice if you've seen enough of these, you know that they typically have a wave border running around them, and this one is fairly rare because it has an inverted rim with, with scrolling vines, and the heaping and piling effect on this on this bowl is just exceptional. And as I said, you can you can go to the site, you can pull it in and really really get a good look at it. Superbly well painted, uh, very sensitively drawn. And it, of course, has a, that, that, that very uh, standard unglazed back. And uh, lately with fakes, they copy these. But this is what the back of a real one should look like. Um, I, you know, I've said many times, if you see an image of something on, on Christie's or Sotheby's, save the image for reference uh, because these come in very, very handy. This is what the back of a Jung Lu, uh dish you know, should look like as far as the texture goes, the glaze, the, the V shape of the foot rim and so forth. Just a, a really, really great looking dish. Estimated at two to three hundred thousand dollars it's good size it's actually 15 inches in diameter but uh, a, a great rarity and then moving over to this one this one is uh, also from the uh, uh, brown collection uh, just absolutely great and what's very interesting about this one is <clears throat> you notice that the, uh, the 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 flowers in the center are coming out of the ground and growing up and spreading out the way they do is they, they, they put normally they don't put the ground in um, so the, these plates aren't directional. This plate is directional, basically, and this is how it should be viewed. Here's the ground, and you have one, one plant coming up and then spiraling out into all these extra vines and flowers. It's just a wonderful treatment. And uh, again, uh, the decoration is superbly well done. Uh, nice heaping and piling effects all the way around. And then I love the, sp the uh, repeat of sprigs around the border. Just nicely done, very generously spaced, and so forth. Uh, an exceptional plate, and again, um, a young law, and they show you a picture of the back of it, and here's another back. So you can build yourself up a nice index of what, what these plates should look like, give you a sense of the texture of the uh, paste and so forth. And of course, the back is entirely decorated with more vines. A great example, it's estimated to hundred to $150,000, just a little under 14 inches in diameter, 13 and three quarter inches, and uh, has good pro uh, provenance. It was last uh, sold at Sotheby's Hong Kong in 1987. That was a while ago. And uh, this was what it seems to be when the Browns did a lot of their, their sort of heavier purchases on rarities. All righty. And then on to, uh, let me see, there was something I wanted to see before I did that. There we go is uh, doom, doom. this one. This is the one that uh, has absolutely amazing um, uh, provenance, okay? And if you look right here, you'll see who it is. Shah Jahan, 1628 to 1658, the fifth emperor of the Mughal dynasty. And how they know that is that this plate was inscribed to him um, after it was made. It was made in China, obviously, and it was sent to India. And uh, 
if you uh, scoot along here, there it is. There's the mark that was placed into the dish. He was an avid collector. As I said before, he built the Taj Mahal for his wife, uh, the famous Taj Mahal. Um, he was a, a, a big patron of the arts, and uh, they had, he had a very good relationship with China as far as trade goes. It was a, a great period. It was the, 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 the era of the Shah Jahan was one of the real high points artistically in India. It was one of the great, great periods uh, for, for, for interest in the arts, cultivation of the arts, and so forth. And this plate was um, um, in his collection. And you, it, it, you know, provenance doesn't get much better than that. And this is a very lovely barbed rimmed example, uh, again, with beautiful vines and uh, uh, nice looking, these lotus uh, shaped devices running around the rim, uh, that, 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 that slightly bluish white uh, glaze. And then, of course, the heaping and piling effect and all the scrolling vines that go with it. Absolutely great young low dish, and it measures also just a little under 15 inches in diameter. It's estimated at two to three hundred thousand dollars, and I, I can't, I don't know, I don't know how this will do, but I, I, I suspect a collector would just absolutely go crazy for this, given its history. Um, uh, from a very, very important collection dating to the 16th century. These pieces that have these early ownership uh, records do not turn up often. They are extraordinarily rare. And uh, it's been in, uh, it was in a private collection up until 1980. And then at the bottom, as it says, Lenore and Walter Brown Collection, San Antonio, Texas. All right, doesn't get any better than that. All right, and then hopping over to uh, this is a really nice Qin Lung period, Lung Yao Mei Ping vase. You've seen them before, but this is a really pretty one, and I wanted to share it because the glaze on this just is absolutely great and uh, uh, even warm, uh, very strong, though. It's a, but, it's, it's, but it's just an absolutely lovely example, uh, beautifully done. I love the texture of, of the colors, how, how it goes in and out. You have these little white areas, light and dark, light and dark. And that beautiful, notice again in this reflection, that lovely sheen of the glaze is how it should look. Shouldn't be super glossy. It should be like this, sort of almost a matte finish, but just beautiful and even and the precision that it, that it ceases at the foot and then goes to white and then underneath and they did provide an absolutely great photograph of the bottom of it uh, for those of you who want to see it this was a, a, as a provenance to Lally and Company in New York Jim Lally who uh, had been for, as many of you know at Sotheby's he really he was one of the big drivers of getting Sotheby's going in Hong Kong many years ago he opened his own gallery in New York and has done a series of uh, 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 very amazing exercises exhibitions, especially on early, early wares, uh, Sung and so forth, a good catalogs, he's a wizard, and uh, this was something he had sold, but absolutely great photograph of the bottom, so you get a sense of um, what it should really look like, all right, and uh, check it out. It's estimated to $100,000, $150,000, it had come from the collection of Edward Warsh to James Lally, and then has been in a private collection ever since, all right. Now, let's mosey on over to this. This is a dandy thing, and it's quite rare. It caught my eye because it is a, a Yongchen marked cobalt ground um, uh, uh, Chan Chu Ping. But, but what was odd is you've seen the form before, but what, what's interesting about this is this is a Yongchen example. Most of the ones that are on the market that were ever made that are known, there's a few of them in the Palace Museum and so forth that were done in Yongchen. But most were done in the next in the next uh, uh, imperial uh, reign under under his son Qin Lung. This is a Yong Chen example, which makes it very rare. Uh, they just didn't do many. They had the ability to do them. They didn't, but they didn't make a lot of them because they were still learning how to refine um, uh, big monochromes and working with cobalts. They they learned how to mix different uh, minerals in the cobalt to 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 induce certain colors, manganese and so forth. And this one is just a stellar example. And uh, I, I really love you to pull this in and get a good hard look at it. It's uh, the glaze is superbly even on this. And this is a pretty big pot. It's about 21 inches tall. <clears throat> Most of them are. The Chin Lung ones are all a rather good size, but this is also a good size. The, 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 the wonderful way the glaze just stops evenly at the top, and then you go down through the body. It's absolutely blemish-free as far as the coating of the glaze goes. There's no mistakes. There's no sags, no nothing, and it just glows like a sapphire. Um, and here's a picture of the bottom. It is estimated at three to $500,000. 
Here's a picture of the bottom. Um, at some point, it had some some sort of inventory marker. That's just the wax crayon that'll just wipe off. But they decided not to. And there's the uh, Yongshan mark, which is rarely seen on these big pots. And then you have this good picture of the f very dirty foot rim. If this foot rim was clean, the, the owner, whoever owned this, obviously never touched it as far as cleaning it up goes, because this foot rim would clean off beautifully. It would be snow white, but it's got a lot of stand dirt on it and so forth. And this is absolutely fantastic. If 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 you want to look at these and you want to understand monochrome glazes, uh, there's also I think a similar example to this in the Bauer collection in Switzerland. Um, who just put out a great book on monochromes a year or so ago. I urge everybody to get it. It's the best book on monochromes that's ever been published. At uh, any rate, uh, this is absolutely uh, great, these shots, because they really give you a sense of the glazes. Because one of the ways that, the, that you can detect the difference between an old piece and, and a modern copy is the texture of the glazes on these pieces when they're trying to emulate Yong Chen or Chin Lung pieces. And uh, this one really gives you um, a, a, a view of what the glaze should look like. Sort of irregular, sort of wobbly, not patterned in any way. Uh, some areas are more uh, orange peely than others and so forth. And uh, on the manufactured modern pieces, um, the, the glaze tends to be extremely uniform, um, almost mechanically so. At uh, any rate, three to five hundred thousand dollars and it, yeah it's 21 and a quarter inches tall that's what i thought and it was bought in 1970 has no prior provenance um i don't know where the where the fellow picked it up uh, nobody seems to know and the current owner uh he bought it over just about 50 years ago all right and then on to this the cover lot of the auction uh an extraordinary Mayping vase they provided a lot of pictures of it that I, which i'm really thrilled about uh, it is the uh, type that was originally developed during the Ming Dynasty, early Ming Dynasty, Shundi period, uh, the, using cobalt and uh, un, uh, uh, cobalt with uh, underglazed blue, cobalt, I mean, uh, cobalt with uh, yellow, uh, and this lovely underglazed blue. This piece just glows. Uh, there's no other way to say it. Uh, if you look at this carefully, it almost looks like the, the uh, pattern, the underglazed blue, is floating. It's, it, it looks almost like this. You see these light areas underneath. The, 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 the artist has, has done this incredible job of implying a shadow as though it, it gives such a strong three-dimensional effect on this piece. Absolutely great. If you look here, you can see it particularly. And down in here, the sh like a shadow under the blue. Uh, just amazing bit of art. I, I, I think this is going to fly. Three to $500,000 estimate, uh, but very, very rare based, as I said, in the Ming form that was been popular during the Qinlung period in the Ming court. It is 12 inches tall, which is a good size. Oh, yeah, the other thing is that it came from the Paul Colesman collection. And uh, 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 Paul Colesman was a... Uh, uh, um, a famous collector, uh, but it was known in the business world as the guy that invented uh, basically the modern-day altimeter um, uh, that was was developed um, uh, in the 1920s and 30s. It became the standard of altimeters for aircraft, military aircraft in particular. And, of course, he, he sold a lot of them. The U.S. Navy bought a lot of them, and eventually the Army Air Corps bought a lot of them. And it made him a very wealthy guy, and he was able to go out and pursue his uh, interests and hobbies. And uh, one of them was art, and Asian art in particular. And this was something that had come down through his collection, um, and it was uh, a bought in the, this was apparently uh, bought in the 1940s. All right. Wow. A great thing. Again, provenance, provenance, provenance. And uh, it was sold at Sotheby's last in 1998, uh, about 20, 22 years ago. All right. And then on to this, the Wanamaker pot. Uh, this is quite a thing, a pair of um, 100 boys jars that came from the collection of John Wanamaker, the famous department store uh, guy. And uh, I, there's a, they actually, in the, in the catalog, they didn't bother putting it in the, um, on, the, on the site, really. But if you go over here, uh, here's a picture of it. And there's an absolutely great uh, story about the family and who, how they own, uh, how they collected and who, how things got passed down. Here they are. In Philadelphia, they were fantastically wealthy people, patrons of the arts, and uh, this picture was taken in 1904 in Florida while they were on vacation. And uh, on the on the uh, top left is John Wanamaker. This is the fellow right here uh, that, that that owned this jar, and uh, these jars, this plural, there's several of them. 
<clears throat> but there's an excellent write-up in here. Um, come over and read it because these are these the hundred boys jars. The hundred boys thing have, have to do with you know fertility in large families and happiness and prosperity. And it was a pattern that was a, 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 a decorative motif that was started in the uh, uh, Ming Dynasty on in blue and white particularly, and then um, uh, evolved during the Qing Dynasty, especially in the Yongchen and Qinlung period, into enameled porcelains. And uh, I love this. Uh, this scene here, and I love the kids because one of the things that you'll notice um, uh, in these early, early uh, uh, Qing Dynasty uh, paintings of the Hundred Boys is that they always depict them. They always seem to depict them at least once riding a hobby horse, because the hobby horse was a, uh, a Chinese invention, uh, which makes it sort of interesting because people always think of hobby horses as being from the Americans Wild West. Now it was before that they were using them as toys in China, um, and 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 then. Of course, uh, they started using them here. I don't know if the West adopted them from the Chinese or it just seemed like a, a natural evolution of toys for children. But at any rate, there's some absolutely great pictures in the catalog. And as always, you can enlarge them and study the drawings, study the faces, and so forth. But these 100 boys jars are fantastically rare, and uh, I suspect uh, it's going to do quite well uh, uh, in the sale when it comes up. Let me see here. What's the uh, – I didn't even look at the estimate. on What's the estimate? Yeah, six hundred or eight hundred thousand to one point two million, um, and here's the here's the uh, the the the, the uh, provenance on it. Uh, never been auctioned that anybody's aware of. They measure about eleven inches tall and are splendidly beautiful. So we'll see how those do. All right, now mosey back over to one more. Uh, there, this. Another unbelievably rare thing. This is a, a, a Qin Lung to Yong Chen period figure. They don't really know when. And, uh, is, you know, during the, during the Qing Dynasty, Buddhism was the sort of the official religion of the country. And uh, as a result, a lot of, a lot of artwork was uh, uh, developed uh, around, the, around the religion. And this is a, an absolutely spectacular porcelain, Famille Rose enamel decorated uh, scene of a, a seated Buddha uh, holding an incense burner in his hand um, on top of a very naturalistic rocky throne. And you'll notice that this decoration here um, uh, of, of the way the rocks are done is also the same way they did rocks um, in, in one-dimensional paintings on porcelain. It's the pattern, it's the style of how it was done. But the way the robes are done on this figure and the facial expression, that, that almost looking like, uh, like, like creamy ivory, the superbly modeled eyes, nose, and so forth, is just exceptional. And again, here they've provided a great number of photographs that are very handy to look at. It's estimated at two hundred to 300000 or two to $400,000. They're giving it a big window because I don't think they really know what it'll bring. These don't turn up on the off auction market very often. Um, one did about uh, 10 years years ago, as I recall, or something, but that was about it. Um, it is a, all, the only provenance on it is that it's from a private collection in the United States. It's nine inches tall, and um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do very, very well. Here's the, they also provided a terrific picture of the back. It's always good to look what the backs of things look like. There you go. Um, again, uh, even more three-dimensional, the way they did the rocks on this, than, than the first one, which I think is fascinating. Uh, but, but, you know, to, to cast these and carve these and make these in porcelain at that time was quite a, tr quite a trick. And then moseying on over here to this. This is one of the best robes I've seen in a long time. And we talked about a robe from the same period in the video last week that was sent to, that was sent to Nepal and ta tailored. I think it was the uh, Doyle sale or the, or the, or the Bonham sale. Um, here's another one, and this is what they um, um, looked like uh, before if, if, if they're not retailed. This is one that was sold by a, a British dealer I happen to have met a number of times named Bob Brandt, Robert Brandt, a uh, great guy. And uh, this is a robe he apparently sold some time ago. He knows a great deal about textiles. And uh, absolutely splendid example, absolutely splendid. And it's in an incredible condition given its age. This is an early 18th century robe. Uh, the, the, the dragons, the, the drawings of the dragons, uh, with, with a very carefully done five claws, almost dainty on this one. And then, the, and then of course, the, the very classical sort of the, uh, uh, skirt across the bottom. And some of this is almost done in, in the manner of Ming workmanship. But again, a, a beautiful, beautiful robe in imperial yellow. And it is estimated at one hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It'll be a test of the market, uh, but to see how see how strong uh, the robe market is these days. But when you have an example that's this perfect, 
Um, uh, there's going to be a lot of interest in it because robes, as you know, silk is you know it's very prone to splitting and de decay, and there's really no way to reverse it. You can only conserve it. This piece looks to be in wonderful shape, and uh, as I as I said, it's got a strong estimate, so we'll test and see how much interest there is in early imperial uh, court robes. All right, and then on to these. This is the section of the sale uh, that has all of the Irving jades in it, um, the Herbert, uh, Florence and Herbert Irving collection of jades. There's also some Herbert and Irving, um, um, uh, 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 Florence and Herbert Irving furniture in this sale. Um, um, they're sort of uh, finishing off things. And if you're a jade collector, you want to check this out because um, let's hop over here to the catalog just for a second. I want to get the page up here for you. Uh, page. 234, I believe, is where it starts. Yeah, here it is, the, J the, the Irving Collection of Jades. What's terrific about this is that these are very nice early jades. He, he, had a, he was a real whiz when it came to jades. We all remember the story of the famous pig jade um, that, that he, he owned that he apparently thought a great deal of and um, ended up selling for several millions of dollars. But he had a very interesting and very eclectic collection of other jades, very early jades, okay, Neolithic jades, Kongs, buys, all this sort of thing. And the estimates of these are quite reasonable. So if you're looking for an authentic piece of early, early jade and early accoutrements, uh, jade accoutrements and hardstone things, check this out because some of these things are in here with estimates of five to seven thousand, three to five thousand, six to seven thousand, that kind of thing. And there's a lot of it. And these are all great and they all have good provenance. So if you're looking for, for interesting things that aren't horrifyingly expensive and um, um, have impeccable provenance, just hang on to the receipts, keep the catalog, and you have something that, that, that is wonderful and, you, and you're keeping something um, um, you know, with, its, with its history. But there's a, a number of lots in here. I forget how many there are. There are, uh, let's see, Irving Collection, there are lots. 17, it's about 63 lots, 63 jade lots in this sale. All of them are interesting. Um, all of them uh, from the Irving collection, and all of them were bought, you know, before basically before 1989, by and large. Some of them were bought much earlier than that, and uh, just great, great, great examples all the way through. Very interesting. I love this Kong. This thing has a very reasonable estimate. It's a little more than a few thousand bucks. It's fifteen thousand to uh, twenty-five thousand dollars, but it's um. um um, very, you know, very handsome. I love the russet staining in it, and it's early, okay, uh, first millennium B.C., all right, 100, a, 100 B.C., in other words. All right, and there's some very fine bronze fittings and so forth in here. Uh, there's another one, of course, the Renlu collection this week, this coming week that's going to have bronze fittings. Yeah, there were also some very good bronze fittings from the Irving collection uh, that might be fascinating. This is a, a really great-looking thing. It's a set of gilt bronze, gilt bronze harness ornaments, and um, it's, it, it's, I love the way they laid it out. And uh, it's estimated at you know seven or eight thousand dollars, which isn't crazy, and uh, it's something you, you might enjoy owning. And I love this this absolutely great Song uh, Song to Ming Dynasty um, uh, uh, Jade Dragon pendant. These these do turn up in the market from time to time. Oops, let's go back. Do turn up in the market from time to time. But this one looks to be a rather fine one, more more fine than most. It, it it's been exhibited, and it, it came from um, the Hans Conried uh, collection. Do uh, you remember Hans Conried? He was the famous actor. All right, so uh, check that out. And then on to, uh, uh, let's see, the next thing is this piece of jade. Uh, this is a great, uh, these are called these marriage bowls. All right, and um, it's, it's green jade, uh, obviously, with these uh, uh, with, uh, slight shading and variations, but very deeply carved, uh, 18th century uh, just a really nice example all the way through. I love the butterflies. They use butterflies on the handles often on these. This one has a nicely done set. And unusually deep uh, carving in the bottom. Um, often the carvings in the bases of these marriage bowls is not as deep as this that it would even produce that much of a shadow. But it really gives it a three-dimensional look. Here's the other end of it. Uh, beautiful thing, estimated at one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars. It, its provenance goes back to the um, uh, uh, Alan uh, and Simone Hartman collection. Uh, Alan Hartman is a longtime multi generational dealer in New York City. Um, uh, they did several sales of some of his jade collection. He's been he started collecting jade with his father in the nineteen fifties. 
and uh, Alan Hartman built up a, 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 a breathtaking collection of, of, of uh, uh, jades, and uh, he sold them. He, was, he, he owns a company in New York called Rare Art, which is one of the finest uh, uh, galleries in the city. And they sell not just Chinese stuff. They sell everything. For a while, they were one of the major players in the Tiffany lighting market. But he's a true antique dealer and a scholar when it comes to jades. This was something that was in his collection, 12 inches in, in length, measured, uh, estimated at 150 to $200,000. All right, and then moseying on over to this. I don't think this just comes from a private American collection. I uh, bought at Christie's in 1998, but you all know what it is. It's an absolutely splendid Chin Lung period deep carved uh, brush pot. Uh, these turn up on the uh, market periodically. They were a favorite of the Chin Lung court. Um, the scenes on them tend to be very deeply carved, uh, 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 meticulously carved, though. You'll notice that when you look at little things like the, uh, the, the, the fellow pushing the cart here with all the objects in it, everything is perfectly uh, displayed. And then you have these beautiful, beautiful uh, pine trees coming up out of, the, uh, out, of the, out of the rocks, coming down off this mountain. And the stone has lots of variation in color, which makes it, makes it sort of evocative. And, 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 and the carver did a heck of a job working in the color differences into his work. So you have lighter jade uh, carving areas, recessed, and then, then darker if we even recessed more. And then the outer edges are much more uh, bright with, with black spots on them and so forth. It's estimated at four to $600,000. Um, these are very rare. This is sort of the range they always seem to bring. It's about seven and a half, a little, under, a little over seven and a half inches tall, but beautifully done, just beautifully done. And then on to this. This is interesting. This is, uh, we, so we looked at the, uh, the, the, the jade inset um, uh, uh, vase a few weeks ago, and we talked about in the, in the sale on Tuesday uh, uh, at the Doyle sale about the uh, uh, gilt bronze, um, uh, the, the gilded uh, box that was made in London in this taste for the Chinese market. And uh, we had talked previously about the interchange of tastes between um, England and uh, or Europe, not just England, Europe in general, France, obviously in this case, in the Chinese artists. And the Chinese artists, of course, influenced taste in China. And this is another example of the, of the French influencing Chinese taste was, the, was with the, 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 the making of this absolutely um, spectacular Chinese clock. Uh, uh, inset with uh, emeralds and semi-precious stones and then, and then works, and then mounted on a Famille Rose Lotus base. Uh, it doesn't get much better than that. Um, these were made in, 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 in uh, the case was made in Guangzhou, uh, is, uh, which, was, which became sort of the mecca for this fine workmanship, and the imperial altiers began making them. They don't know exactly when this was made, 18th to 19th century. I suspect late Qinlong, early Chai Qing period, but a, a really great example, estimated at $79,000, $90,000. It is big. It's 15 inches tall and uh, has uh, limited, limited provenance. Just as all it says is private collection, California. Uh, but they have, they have these. The Chinlung Court was fascinated with clocks, and uh, they had a massive collection of French-style clocks. But the workmanship on this is absolutely superb. And there's a nifty shot of the back of it to show the enameling. All right, there, there's the very, very fine enameling on the back. There's the key and so forth. But you notice that the enameling is very much like French enameling around the inside. And then, of course, the use of uh, semi-precious stones done in, the, uh, in this sort of Greek key fret pattern running around the back. And then uh, the top with these uh, sort of Rococo vines and everything, very much in the taste of the Chinlung Court. Um, I suspect they, the, 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 some were made after that because the atelier, the Qinlong atelier, has continued working into the Jai Qing almost up to the Daokon period. All right, now let's mosey on over to this. This is a nifty thing. Um, this form, uh, many of you recognize it, it's, it is a late Ming form. Um, these were done during the Ming Dynasty in this shape, um, 16th century typically, with the with these very wasted, very very curvy, uh, wasted uh, lower section, swollen shoulder, and then then it, it, then scooping in quickly to this long attenuated neck with handles mounted on it, beautiful uh, celadon green glaze on it, but it's a Chin Lung example and it's Mark and period. 
And this is makes it a really interesting thing. It's estimated at fifty to seventy thousand dollars, which doesn't sound crazy, because they didn't make many of these. This is a really rare form. And again, it was it was part of that uh, Chin Lung era where they were they were they were trying to recreate uh, things from the uh, from the, the known from the Ming Dynasty in maybe by shape, but then giving it a different color, experimenting, doing things that are pleasing. And the Celadon green on this is, of course, that really great. Um, Seafoam green, almost like Canuta, uh, 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 not Canuta, but uh, the seafoam green um, that they did in Celadons with a, with a bit of blue in it that was uh, so popular, uh, especially among Japanese collectors. Absolutely great example. Uh, it is 14 and a half, quarter inches tall, which is a, a, it's just slightly smaller than some of the uh, the bigger Ming examples got. They got up to maybe 15 to 18 inches tall. Uh, I had one years ago that was the, uh, a Ming one that was um, in uh, uh, Sunkai glaze and I think it was about 17 and a half 18 inches tall but a really nice piece really really nice piece and then at the end this is the last thing we're going to look at I put these in here just because I thought these were just plain flat out beautiful they don't have a huge estimate they were made during the 18th century they're estimated around fifteen thousand dollars but I love these lacquer this this sort of lac book stop look at this Look at the quality of this lacquer work. If you're looking, if you're a lacquer buyer, boy, this is an absolutely splendid uh, pair of uh, lacquer cups and stands, a cup and under trays. Um, a beautiful, beautiful quality. Uh, some of the finest, uh, most meticulous lacquer work I've ever seen on a pair of cups. Uh, and I think the estimate is extremely reasonable for what these are. They're 18th century, uh, but really, really, truly lovely. Uh, mother of pearl and inlaid lacquer cups and saucers, 18th century, blah, 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 five inches, two inches on the cups in height. They were sold at Sotheby's last time around in 1981 and have a ten to $15,000 estimate. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, get a condition report, but b boy, if you're, if you're a lacquer buyer and you're never going to be able to shell out a million dollars or a half a million dollars for fabulous Imperials, type. Uh, the, these are splendid. These are really satisfying, I think. Absolutely great. All right. And that's the sale. And there's a lot more. Come over to uh, bitamount.com. Check out the catalog in there. Or just go over to Christie's and check it out on their own site. Uh, the catalogs have more written information in some cases. But the uh, on-site stuff has uh, those wonderful essays uh, 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 that are also extremely informative. So I suggest you do both if you're really interested in learning about this stuff. If you enjoyed the video, um, like, share, and subscribe, as they say. And uh, leave a comment down below. Uh, visit us over at bitamount.com and see what we're doing over there. We're always, we're always adding stuff that's on the market. And uh, global member pages are updated every day, which you, of course, can subscribe to. And uh, that's it. And uh, when the sales come up, if we're able, we're going to try and um, record some of them and share share excerpts and highlights from the auctions um, for all of you to see if you, if you don't have the time to watch them online yourself. And uh, that's about it. All right. I hope I wish everybody in New York they do really great this week uh, coming up. Uh, they've all done an excellent job under very trying circumstances. And, um, you know, if you talk to them or call them, thank them for it. <laughs> all right. Because they broke their necks to put this together and, and done a great job. All right. Have a wonderful week. We'll be back later um, on Friday with our regular weekly video. Thanks so much. Bye bye.